This is chapter 10. We're going to talk about treating eyes and ears. First of all, we need to be able to examine uh, the eyes or the ears and um, including any external ocular features such as the eyelids, the sclera, the cornea, the third eyelid, which is the dictating membrane. We need to include the internal ocular features, which is looking at the anterior chamber, the iris, and the lens. Now, often your doctor will do this with an ophthalmoscope, but you can also get in the habit of looking at it and looking for differences and changes. Some of this needs to be seen with highly specialized equipment. So in some cases, this animal does need to go to an ophthalmologist versus a general practitioner. To remind you what we're looking at with the eye, we have the cornea, which is something that we typically will be able to diagnose and treat in the general practice. Also looking at the lids, making sure that our, our lids are uh, functioning normally, going over the cornea, um, supplying the cornea with the nutritive um, uh, lacrimal apparatus, which, is, which are the tears, uh, looking at the pupils, and making sure the iris uh, is um, intact and the pupil is dilated or constricted appropriately. The limbus is what is in between the cornea and the sclera. The sclera is the white, tough, fibrous uh, connective tissue around the eyeball. Looking at the conjunctiva, if it is red, reddened and uh, swollen, that can be an indication that there's something going on. Uh, making sure the nictating membrane is not sticking out um, further than it should be. Uh, and then looking at the interior um, uvea, or u uvea, the aqueous humor here and in the anterior side chamber and the posterior behind the iris, making sure that we don't have any precipitates or proteins that are flashing out at us when we shine a light on it. Sometimes we can see the lens itself uh, if it is hardened, uh, like in a, in a seven-year-old or older animal, it will become hardened and harder for them to focus. So they have to use glasses when they're reading the newspaper. If, they, if it is cloudy, as in a cataract, uh, that's completely different as well. If you're using specialized equipment, you can also see all the way back to the retina, which is this nervous layer of the eye that has contact with the vitreous body and the nutritive um, components of the vitreous body. And it, it is continuous with the optic nerve. Behind the retina, we have the choroid, which is the vascular body, and then the whole covering with the fibrous connective tissue, which is the sclera. Clients placing telephone calls to the veterinary hospital to discuss potential eye problems in a patient should be made to realize that these situations should be considered or could be considered an emergency. If an animal has sudden blindness or they have red eyes or they have cloudy eyes, that is an emergency. We need to see those patients, make sure that they're not going to lose their vision permanently or that they're not going to lose their eye. Some clients tend to let these ocular programs progress to severe stages before treatment is, is sought. So if you look at this, this is a dog with a third eyelid gland that is prolapsed outside of the eye that can cause this eye to become damaged. Uh, this is a cloudy eye showing edema in between the layers of the cornea, and this is usually indicative of a pretty severely diseased eye and painful eye. There are two different types of medication that we put in the um, eye to dilate the pupils or constrict the pupils, but typically we're dilating the pupils. These dilation, pupil dilatory, dilatory agents are either midriatic or cyclopegic. Midriatic agents dilate the pupils, which facilitates the examination of the posterior segment and the fundus of the eye, so we can look beyond the lens. Cyclopegic agents paralyze the accommodative muscle of the ciliary body. In some cases, this action can minimize pain associated with ciliary spasms. So there may be times when we choose a cyclopegic agent over a midriatic agent. Often these agents are used, the cyclopegic agents are used before and after ophthalmic surgery. So phenylephrine hydrochloride is a drug that produces midriasis but does not produce cyclopegia. It's used in the evaluation of uveitis, glaucoma, or scleritis. So uveitis would be inflammation of the uvea or the anterior or posterior chambers of the eye, the fluid in there. Um, 
scleritis would be inflammation of the sclera. So if you see reddening of the sclera, we can put some phenylephrine in there and see what happens. It can also be used to detect the presence of Horner syndrome. If you remember Horner syndrome, it's a uh, paralysis of facial nerve. Uh, so it causes paralysis, partial paralysis of the face. We um, will use it before conjunctival surgery to reduce hemorrhage or in combination with atropine. So phenylephrine acts like uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine uh, as a sympathetic agent to constrict blood vessels. Atropine sulfate produces medriasis and psychopegia. So it will decrease pain in the eye if we have a really constricted uh, pupil that's, and we're, it, we think it's due to um, spasms of the ciliary body, we can use atropine to reduce that. We also use it to, uh, to, to we use it to treat uh, and also uh, look in the back of the eye for a fundic exam. So that's typically what they'll use on your eye in order to take, to take a look and do a, a, a good exam of the back of your eye. It's used in acute inflammatory conditions of the anterior uveal tract. It's contraindicated in glaucoma and KCS, keratoconjunctivitis dry eye. So keep in mind, we are not going to use atropine in those two um, instances. Epinephrine or dipavalo epinephrine, like phenylephrine, causes vasoconstruction and reduces production of aqueous humor. So it's used to reduce intraocular pressure, so it's going to be used for glaucoma, produces medriasis, or aids in the diagnosis of Horner syndrome. So this can also be used for that. The uh, dipavalo and epinephrine will penetrate that corneal barrier, barrier and is converted to epinephrine in the cornea. So midri midriasis is to dilate the pupil. Meiotics will produce pupillary constriction. We will use this in the treatment of chronic open angle glaucoma, acute and chronic closed angle glaucoma, and some cases of secondary glaucoma. So typically, we constrict the pupil. We actually are relieving the pressure in the eye by allowing the outflow of the aqueous humor. So we're opening the drain up to relieve the pressure. Pilocarpine is a cholinergic drug. So it's not an adrenergic drug. It's a cholinergic drug that is also used to treat open chronic open angle glaucoma so it is used for open angle glaucoma it st also stimulates tear production so we can use it in some cases of keratoconjunctivitis sicca some other things that reduce intraocular pressure remember we talked about carbonic anhydrase inhibitors in the renal discussion uh, as a diuretic it decreases the production of aqueous humor to control glaucoma and sometimes we can actually give it orally or IV rather than topically. Topical anesthetics anesthetize the corneal surface. There are some nerve endings in the corneal surface. You would know that if you've got something in your eye. These are commonly used to facilitate removal of a foreign body or suture. We could also use them when you're using instruments to measure intraocular pressure like a tonometer or a tonopet. We also want to use it if we're going to put a contact on the uh, on the cornea. So if we put a hydrophilic contact lens on, we'll want to use a um, topical anesthetic. We do want to warm them because they're stored in the refrigerator because otherwise it's uncomfortable when you put it on the eye. Propericane hydrochloride uh, is an anesthesia, uh, topical anesthesia that lasts five to 10 minutes. And we use it for tono pen. Uh, unopened bottles can be stored at room temperature, but once they're open, we want to put them in the fridge. Here's an ophthalmic stain. This is fluorescein eye stain. The procedure that I use, usually use, the procedure that is listed on the, on the label is different from the one that I typically use. Now, with the label, it tells you to um, sterilely unwrap the, the paper uh, product. Do not touch the orange tip. Put a drop of, um, of the stain, or I'm sorry, saline or uh, eye cleanser on the tip of that and allow that drop to fall into the eyeball. If you've ever tried to do that with an animal that doesn't want its eye opened in the bright light, uh, then you know that it's difficult to do. So what I do is I carefully and sterilely uh, rip off that um, end, that orange end, put it into a, uh, a 3 ml syringe, carefully put in uh, the, the eye wash solution or sterile saline and then use that to drip it into the eye and that way we can see any uh, defect in the cornea. 
You do not want to allow that fluorescein strip to touch the cornea because you can cause a paper cut. So this is how I do it. A 6cc syringe or a 3cc syringe, uh, put it in there. Be careful with horses. They do have strong palpebral muscles, so it's difficult to get it in there. Um, well, you may have to have another person hold the eyelids open. Uh, it will stain the hair if you allow it to drain onto the face, so you want to use cotton to wipe away excess fluorescein stain. You also want to watch it drip, um, drop and, and end up in the nasal cavity because that tells us that we have a normal nasolacrimal duct. Some antibacterial agents commonly used in the eye. Now we need to remember that it must be labeled for ophthalmic use. If it's not labeled for ophthalmic use, it's not going to have the right pH to be safe in the eye. A lot of these are used to treat superficial ocular infections that result from antibacterial or from bacterial organisms, and they're usually used together to get a broad spectrum activity. Bacitracin is usually mixed with polymyxin B sulfate and neomycin. So bacitracin, polymyxin B, and neomycin to make a triple antibiotic ophthalmic solution. Um, but you can get them separately as well. This treats gram positive B treats gram negative um, infections, and neomycin has a broad spectrum activity. Chloramphenicol has a broad spectrum activity uh, on its own, but it is antagonistic with aminoglycosides, meaning we would not want to give it at the same time. Genomycin and tobramycin are aminoglycosides, and they uh, are used to treat conjunctivitis caused by susceptible bacterial agents. They can cause ototoxicity, so eat problems with the ears, and renal toxicity, even if you're giving it in the eyes, so we do have to be careful. Fluoroquinolone is... Uh, enrofloxacin is a typical fluoroquinolone that we use in the eyes, and the most common form of that is Batril. This uh, treats established gram-negative infections, so it's very helpful. We can use corticosteroids in the eyes, but we do not want to use it if we have deep corneal ulcers, fungal infections, or viral infections. It will delay healing. Corticosteroid agents are used to treat inflammatory conditions of the cornea, iris, conjunctiva, sclera, and anterior uvea. Topical corticosteroids have poor penetration into the eyelid and the posterior segment of the eye. They can be used in combination with antibacterial agents to manage your ocular infections, but we have to be careful about these things here. Okay? Typically used as ointments or solutions, so drops or ointments, and you usually see it as prednisolone, hydrocortisone, dexamethasone, betamethasone, fluoromethylone, and flumethasone. So we just have to be very careful before we allow an, uh, a person to use this in the eye of an animal that we have checked with a fluorescein stain to make sure that they don't have any coronal ulcers. When we're treating dry eye, which is known as KCS or keratoconjunctivitis sicca, the most common agent that we use is cyclosporine, also known as Optimune. Optimune is the is a fairly expensive medication. We can get cyclosporine uh, compounded out a little bit more cheaply, so it's something to look for. And it is used in the management of KCS and chronic superficial keratitis. It stimulates increased tear production, and you only need to use it once or twice a day. Any other medication you use in the eye, you typically need to use more than twice a day because the eye, the, the um, uh, tearing will wash it out. Otic drugs. First of all, never use otic drugs in the eye, ever. Don't ever do it. We can use eye drugs in the ear, but we will never use otic drugs in the eye. So remember, we have a vertical uh, tube and a horizontal tube going to this eardrum that should be intact. If it's not intact, that changes what we can put in the ear. Some anti-infective agents that are pretty common, um, we can have some that in contain anti-inflammatory agents and reduce inflammation and decrease pruritus. I always want to, if I have excess hair in, in or around the air, can clip it or pluck it we want, if it's not too painful. We want to clean the ear out and then apply the otic anti-infective agents. If you don't clean it out first, you have to, you, your agent that you use has to work two, three, ten times as hard and usually you won't get the job done. So clean it first. You have much less that you have to treat. Genomycin sulfate is an aminoglycoside. 
that is used for the treatment of acute and chronic otitis and dogs is very broad spectrum, um, but we may need to uh, check to be sure that the bacteria is sensitive to it. Cats can be used, it can be used to treat superficial infected lesion, lesions that are susceptible to genomycin, but we do have to be careful with more careful with cats. We have to realize that aminoglycosides cause ototoxicity and can cause renal toxicity as well. So here's some formulations you may have seen, Genoved, Genesin, Otomax, Momentasac, Max, and Triotic. Neomycin sulfate, known as, uh, it's in Tresiderm, Tritop, and Panalog. It's antibacterial, often combined with corticosteroids, antifungals, and other anesthetics, um, and or anesthetics, so local anesthetics. Um, it's antibacterial. And then if uh, combined with other things, antifungal can also be antiparasitic and anti-inflammatory. It's used for the treatment of otitis externa and certain bacterial, fungal, and inflammatory skin disorders as well. Enrofloxacin is Batril. It is uh, available as a combination otic pro product with silver sulfadiazine. Silver sulfadiazine has very healing properties to it. It's also used in combination with a product uh, in a combination product that is, um, uh, we've had compounded, but it's also known as Magic Ears, Ketoconazole, Triamcinolone, it's um, also known as Batrol, Nystatin, and Triamcinolone, BNT, uh, and it's the product that you can leave in the ears for two to three weeks at a time, but then you have to clean it out. It's kind of waxy. Uh, antiparasitics. Ear mites are the most common parasites affecting ears of dogs, cats, and rabbits. Now, most commonly, we're going to see it in cats. Pyrethrins um, can be used to kill parasites. Trezoderm is the most commonly dispensed pyrethrin-containing ear medication. Sometimes, ivermectin is a medication of antiparasiticide that we will mix with mineral oil and put into the ears, but we have to use it at the right dose, and we have to let the owners know because it is off-label. When we use Trezoderm to treat parasites, we must use it for three weeks because of the life cycle of the animal and the fact that this comes out of the ear very um, quickly, so daily. We have to retreat daily, twice a day for three weeks. Some cleaning agents. So it's really important, as I said, to clean the ears, and it helps to provide odor control as well. They can have a, also have an antimicrobial agent in it, an anesthetic, or a drying agent. Drying agents are really important in cleaning agents because we want to leave the ear canal a little bit drier uh, to lessen the, fat, the um, uh, bacteria and yeast wanting to grow in that medium. Um, so when wax and debris are impacted in the horizontal canal, it can be necessary to really flush that ear canal to remove the wax and debris before starting a routine cleaning. There are cleaning agents uh, like cerumenolytics um, that remove the cerumen, which is that wax. Uh, it really breaks it down and removes it, but those are fairly oily. Uh, I do have some videos. They should still work. Uh, they're about flushing the ears out, making sure it's nice and clean. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, we'll talk more about these agents in class.